I am excited about today, excited about the weather, excited about uh, the great things going on, and I hope you are too. I hear that it's going to get cold again this week, and that's why we call it April Fools. It's the whole month, not the day. So uh, every time you think it's spring, it's spring, it's sprung, and it becomes winter again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for those gathered here. Thank you for your love. Thank you for uh, life. Thank you for the good things you give us. Thank you for hope. Thank you for healing. Wow, what happened with that lady that was hit by the car and we are all, it's true, scrambling to pray and it was tragic and, and now she's going home. Father, sometimes that's the way you work. You just want to do uh, something miraculous and quick so that we can see your power and understand your glory. And other times you stretch it out a little bit for us to learn some lessons. Uh, Father, you are in control. We believe in your power, your sovereignty, your ability to heal, and your ability to soften our hearts when you need to. And you always want to. And we thank you for your goodwill, that you have good intentions, that you look out for us more than we look out for ourselves. Father, I pray for your blessing today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to tell a little bit of a story first. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, uh, it's called Seeds in Stony Places. It comes from that famous parable. I think it's probably the most famous of parables that Jesus taught. It's the parable of the seeds, the parable of the sower, the parable of the soils. Uh, it's been called those different things. And, you know, there's the good soil and the bad soil, the stony soil, the, sto the soil on the path, the, the, the different types of soils. And he's talking about our hearts. And he's talking about, you know, when the word goes out, what kind of uh, receptor are you? What kind of soil are you when the seeds of the word come towards you? Do you deflect them because your heart is hard or do you let the seeds in because your heart is soft? And so he gives it in farmer's terms and it's become a famous parable. I'm not going to read the whole parable because I only want to focus on one type of heart today. And that is the stony heart, okay? That is the hard heart. That is the heart uh, that we're going to focus on, and I think we'll have enough material just to go there. But before we get there, I want to tell a little bit of it about an adventure I had, which seems like lifetimes ago. I was a college student in Israel, in Jerusalem, and my buddy and I, who ended up being my best man in marriage, uh, John, we went on a uh, journey into the West Bank because we wanted to go to this monastery that was in the desert. And this particular monastery called Marsaba is, is down in some canyons that look like the Grand Canyon and it's built on the cliff side so it's very protectable and as a result it's the longest standing, still existing, uh, continuously occupied monastery on the planet. Uh, and Marsaba basically headed out into those caves that were in those canyons and started his uh, seclusion there in the 400s. So somewhere around 450 or some 430 or somewhere in there. And so he was eager to seek God with all his heart and to really become a prayer warrior and to uh, find God all by himself in seclusion. But before long, people began to hear about it and they wanted to pray with him and be with him and seek God together with him. And uh, uh, more and more men had it out there and even some women, which was kind of revolutionary. And before long, there was 150 of these guys on the cliffs building a monastery and uh, it stood through the Ottoman Empire, it stood through the Crusades, it stood through all the battles of the Middle East and remained on that cliff with people dedicated to uh, what their purposes were. And so I wanted to go see this place. And so Jonathan and I went there and it's a, a little bit dangerous the journey, journey to get there because of crossing into areas in which uh, they're not as friendly to Christians or to tourists or whatnot. And we eventually got there, and maybe I'll tell some of the stories that happened some other time in the process of getting there. But so we're inside the monastery, and the pride that the, the monk wants to show us is they want to show me Marsaba himself. So he's like 15, over 1,500 years old now, you know. And so he's laying down in this fish tank looking thing without any liquid in it. And his, his bones are there and his flesh and his tendons and his muscles have dried into his face. 
And the monk is very proud because he's got this petrified body of Marsaba sitting there who is as hard as a rock. And, you know, I know because it's below sea level basically where we're at and it's very arid, it's a climate in which it's very dry because of the desert that it's not uncommon for things that we're living to petrify. Uh, I don't know if you've ever picked up a piece of petrified wood, you know, and uh, any, any wood that's lodged deep under the dirt and not able to be exposed to oxygen or air and it's decaying, it eventually becomes hard as a rock and it becomes petrified. And that's where we get that, that term, petrified wood. And, uh, and it's heavy. And so here was poor old Marsaba, petrified, hard as a rock, laying there. And the, and the monks were very proud of the fact that we could still look at his dead body and, and uh, observe some of his sunken features uh, there at, at the monastery. <coughs> So today, what does that have to do with anything? It has to do with, I want to talk about petrified hearts. I want to talk about hard hearts. You know, Jesus was very concerned that sometimes his word would go out, and it would go out to a heart that was hard. I want to also say from the get-go that I picked the pictures today uh, based on a certain feature, and that is, here's a seed that somehow landed on a very hard surface, but went ahead and made life. Somehow beyond all uh, of, of our, our imagination, a tree is growing on top of a rock. And so uh, if you come to the conclusion today that there are aspects of your heart that are hard, that I want you to have this seed of faith in your heart right now, that even in the hardest of hearts, that God, through the power of his spirit, can break that hardness and make life grow again. And so even though we may not be the softest soil, and even though there may be weeds or maybe stones or even a path or our heart has been walked on and it's hard with bitterness and, and hatred and unforgiveness, that God's power through his spirit can penetrate that and change it and he can take a hard heart and he can break it and he can bring life again. And that's my whole goal today. That's it. I mean, I could quit right now. If you got that, I could quit right now. The rest of the sermon, I'm just going to expand on that. You know, the heart is normally associated with emotions of the soul, while the intellect of the mind is normally what happens in the brain. For some reason, we've said that the human heart is considered the seat of the soul. You know, why is that? Why do we call the heart the seat of the soul? The heart is the very first organ to appear when we come into a physical form. Before the brain is ever formed in our mother's womb, the heart beats. Okay. We come into that physical form. It is the first organ. It is often called the seat of the soul because its first appearance drums the bridge between this life and another. The heart circulates blood under stress, joy, emotion, and anger. It may skip a beat when startled or touched by spoken words. The pulse slows and speeds up, not just by exercise or perception, but by emotion itself. That's interesting. Because most of our body is physically motivated. It, it, it has a cause and effect that is physical. But there's something about the heart that is touched to, to make a beat skip itself just on the concept of something you heard or something you thought or something you read or something you saw and all of a sudden your heart is racing or it's slowed down or skipping a beat. And that's one of the mysteries of the heart. The heart is very fascinating and has been for thousands of years. So in this passage of Matthew where the parable of the soils is told, there's one verse in which he speaks about the word going out and the seed being planted. It's, it, it's an interesting parable and worth your quiet time reading later the whole chapter because Jesus not only tells the, the parable, but then he goes on to take private time with his closest disciples and explain to them what the parable meant and why he spoke it in a parable in the first place. You know, because sometimes Jesus doesn't just talk plainly. And so they're a little confused. Why did you tell the story in the first place? Why didn't you talk plainly? And now why are you talking plainly to us? And so all that's packed in there, but that's not the sermon today. But in Matthew 13, 20, it says, as he's explaining this parable of the seed, he says, but that 
He that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that hears the word and immediately with joy receives it, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a little while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is entrapped or he falls away. So it's the seed gets in there and it grows quick because there's a little bit of dirt, but then it's not able to get root, has no root. And then when persecution or tribulation comes because of the word, it, it can't take it. It's out. It's, it's time to, to get away. In Luke uh, eight thirteen, the parable is told again, and Luke says, The ones on the stony ground are the people who joyfully welcome the word when they hear it, but since they don't have any roots, they believe for a little while, but in a time of testing, they fall away. Okay. So we're going to look at these different reasons why uh, that stony heart resists the word. Why that stony heart is stony and why it pushes the word away. Some thoughts to consider while we're going into that is that God desires to break up our stony soil. He desires to break up, in the Bible it says, the fallow ground. He wants to till the hard heart. That's his desire. Another thought is, what good is it to plant seeds into hard soil? You know, if you're a seed planter, a lot of times uh, if we were just flat out farming, you're looking to plant your seeds in the best soil available. But here, that's not what's going on. The seed planter, who is Christ himself, who's God, is planting that seed all over the place. The seed's not just landing in the good soil. The seed is landing also on hardened soil. Why would he allow his seed to be scattered so much like that? He may as well have thrown all his seed on a rock. Why, why would he do that? And... Yeah, we'll pause. We'll leave that. I'm going to go to my next thought. Hard. Stay on this slide, though. Hardness. Stony ground. I, I wanted to know a little bit more about what he meant by stony, and I told you the story about being petrified. And um, when he's sitting there with the disciples, it's interesting. They're like, why do you always talk to the crowd in parables, Jesus? You don't just talk straight to us. And he says, well, because their hearts are calloused. This is Matthew 13, 15. In the same chapter, he says, their hearts are calloused. He uses a different term here uh, in the Greek. And uh, literally, it means that they're in the King James. I like the King James sometimes. I, 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 it's a poetic masterpiece. And he says, their hearts have waxed gross. And so I, I got to figure out what does that really mean? And so I'm digging it up and, and, and trying to get into it in the Greek. And once I get there, it says their hearts have thickened. Their hearts have become dull with fat. I'm thinking, wow, this is such true. I mean, today, like when a heart is, is in trouble physically, it, it, they talk about cholesterol and our diets and the arteries and all this stuff. And, and Doc, he's, he's definitely going through some stuff now. But I watched him all most, well, at least the last 26 years. And, and uh, he's a man of, of, of good diets. So sometimes it happens to uh, the, the best of us, even if we ate well all our lives. So no offense to you, Doc. I, I, but, but sometimes your bad heart is because it's filled with fat and the diet you eat has is, is made it get to where it is. Maybe, you know, you're, you're suffering in your heart and your arteries because of your diet or your lack of exercise or a number of things. But that's embedded in the Greek. And I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. You know, right in the concept of the Greeks is already this idea. And that's 2000 years ago. They're already familiar with the fact of a calloused heart. A heart that doesn't function right is because of fat. Okay. And so I'm thinking spiritually, okay, Jesus wasn't teaching a lesson on, to physicians here. He was talking to farmers. He was trying to get them to understand that some people's are, uh, hearts are so fat that they can't see or hear. And his audience was the Jewish people. 
They had gotten so much of the Word. They were so exposed to the Word. They were drunken in the Word. They were filled with the Word. They were arguing about the Word. They were splitting hairs over the Word. They were straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. And Jesus is saying their hearts are so fat, they've got so much Word in them, they can't even hear anymore. And so he's going after it. He wants to go after it. He wants to break their hearts again. He, Jesus is amazing because he, he's not into abandonment. Jesus is not the, the father who wants to abandon the mission. But he wants to find what is the tool that is going to do the surgery so that I can bring life to this person again. And so focusing again on one target here, and that is the hard hearts, Jesus is interested in doing the surgery to take that calloused heart and make it soft again. In this uh, other verse, uh, when he literally speaks of the hardened heart, uh, we're going to see there's several terms that he uses for hardened heart. One is the fat, one is the petrification, and uh, one is just, uh, we're going to see in a minute, that means literally that uh, it's a heart that has become difficult. He uses a term that means your heart has become hard, meaning difficult. It's complex and it's difficult to get to anymore because it's got too many channels. It's got too many um, things going on with it for me just to speak right into it and, and help it to change. And he's after them all. He's like, man, I want to change your heart today. I want to do heart surgery. So here's the one definition uh, that I put up here on the slide. It says to petrify, and this is more of the one I was referring to at first, to harden, to render callous, to, to calcify, to be unresponsible, to be dense, completely lacking sensitivity or spiritual perception, to be cold, stiff, unfeeling, guarded, untrusting, deflective, and unbelieving. And I left the big question up there. What does it mean to have a hardened heart? And I threw in the verse that Ty read, and I will also give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will take away the stony heart from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And so the very elements of the new covenant, this new covenant promise that we hear prophesied in the book of Ezekiel depicts that he is working with a group of people whose hearts are completely calloused, hard, petrified, stony, repelling him, and he's saying, I'm going to take your hard heart and give you a heart of flesh, and I'll make you live again through the power of my spirit. And I say, praise my mighty God, because he loves us that much that he'd want to take a heart that is that hard, that resists him, that deflects him, that speaks against him, that doesn't want to stand for him. And he says, I want to take that heart and give it a new heart. I'm like, man, I want to be on that team. I want to be with a God that wants to love me to that degree. And so I, I know that uh, as we talk about hard hearts, it can put you in a hopeless position. But I want to remind you that that's exactly the position that God wants you so that when he redeems you and he helps you to be born again, the glory will go to him and you'll understand that it is he who de desired it and that he who did it. He can break the hard calluses off our hearts. So how do you know when a heart is hard? You know a heart is hard. I, I, I actually want to get some feedback on this one, but the, the, a couple things that pop into my mind. I know a heart is hard when there's a lack of compassion. When I experience a person who has a lack of compassion, I know that their heart has been hardened. A lack of compassion is the result of being burned. It's the result of, I gave compassion once and look what it got me. It stung me. I tried to feed the stray dog and he bit me. A lack of compassion is the result of a bitterness of being hurt, and it's a callousing that happens to us. A lack of concern for the lost, I know, is a sample of a hard heart. Because if we're not concerned for the lost, then we're not really grateful for our own salvation. 
We're not in tune with what we've been given. We, we're not in tune with our own lostness. We're not in tune with who we were before God got a hold of us. We're not in tune that every good and perfect and, and pleasing thing that we have as an attribute in our life, our job, our family, our friends, our interactions, our good health, we're not realizing it's a gift of God because when you come to the, the, the great a uh, notion that it's God's gift. Every aspect of goodness in your life is God's gift to you, not something you deserved. It's his mercy. It's his love toward you. Then all you want to do is share it. Because that's what gratitude does. Gratitude shares, man. Gratitude says, man, this was free to me and it's free to you. Here, have some. Wait, I'm taking your last one. Yeah, take my last one. There's probably more coming. <laughs> take it all. If you don't have compassion for the lost or a concern for the lost, then you got to check your heart. It's hardening. Yeah. I listed a few up here. A uh, hard heart does not welcome the word. It may welcome the word, like Jesus said. It welcomes it at the beginning, but it's unchanged by it. It hears the word over and over and over again, but it's not changed. It reminds me of confession without repentance. Confession without repentance. It's the idea that Oh, man, I blew it. Here's what I did. And then you go and do it again. Why'd you confess? Why'd you even acknowledge that it was a blow it when you don't even believe it's a blow it? Why'd you confess it as sin if you're just going to do it again? The Bible calls us to repentance. We heard a little bit about it in Bible study, and I was thinking, wow, this is, this is God moving here. But God calls us to repent. He enables us to repent. Repentance is available. And it, it just shocks me when I hear people think that they can't change. They accept sin and say to themselves, I cannot change. And what I hear is, I cannot be born again. What I hear is every promise in the Bible is not true. What I hear is the Spirit of God cannot set me free. Now, I'm not saying you can be sinless. But I am absolutely saying you can go to war in the sin that has attacked you and plagued you in your life. And you can change. You don't have to be the person you used to be. Jesus came to set you free and to help you live a victorious life of freedom. The Word... They hear the word, but they're not changed. You, you do not stand for the word in tribulation. All of a sudden, you know, when, when you're in a group of peers and, and uh, you hear the word being bantered or, or mocked or put down and, and you don't stand up. Uh, Richard was camping on a word today. It started with the letter A. Acquiescence. Acquiescence. It was the idea that, that you just kind of blend into the shadows. You may have a different opinion, but you don't speak up. You're, you're kind of like an accomplice to the crime because you don't do anything to stop it or say anything. You just get quiet and you let the, the world say what they want to say, even though you're a part of the conversation. You've been invited to the table for some reason, and they've said, hey, I think abortion's cool, or hey, I think a, a, a homosexuality is acceptable, or, or any a number of the things that the world has now put on the table as okay. Murder's okay. Sexual adultery is okay. Sexual deviation is okay. It's all, uh, your sexual preference is okay. And all of this stuff the world has begun to bend the rules on, and maybe you've been invited to the table, and you remain quiet. That's a hardened heart. That is a hardened heart. It's maybe not completely hardened, but it's fearful and it's ready to run at the tribulation, at the trouble. You compromise the word and persecution. You don't want to face the fact that you're going to be opposed by your convictions. It's a hardened heart. You ultimately let the word offend you. You actually begin to bend. If you, if you let your heart and heart go far enough, you'll eventually get to the point where you'll be like, you know, I don't know why the word says that. Maybe the word shouldn't say that. Maybe we could uh, redefine that. Maybe we should try to figure out how to reinterpret that. Maybe we could just change that a little bit. And you get the word to be positioned into your cultural morality and you try to make the Bible represent the way that people believe today instead of making the Bible speak for God as it used to do. You want it to speak for today's society instead. You think that we're wiser. And so you bend the word. You let the word offend you. 
and in the time of testing, you fall away. What are other examples that may pop into your heart that would be indicators that you have a hard heart? Go for it, Roberta. Okay, so from what I understand, what you're saying is they go and they hear the word, but they don't hear it. They hear a whole different thing. They just somehow, they, 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 input doesn't become output. And I think in, an, in another crowd over here, we heard a million say, uh, an example of a hard heart is unforgiveness. What else? Lack of patience with kids. <laughs> kids. How about just anybody? <laughs> Sounds like confession over there. <laughs> lack of patience. Lack of patience. You should know this by now. Come on, you should know this by now. <laughs> uh, lack of trust in God and his plan for us. So, uh, we're, we're hardened heart is just, you're not too sure God is trustworthy. God, I, I think you maybe got confused with somebody else's message. The angels may not have delivered the mail correctly. I think I got my path figured out a little better than you do. Sydney. Dwelling on unnecessary emotions. Dwelling on unnecessary emotions. Does that look like, like when you're angry at someone and you just stay angry just because you want to feel angry at them? Okay. I like it. She's, she defined it. I was going to define it for her, but she says it's like when you're angry and you just want to stay angry because I have a right to be angry. There's lots of ways to creep into the hard heart, but uh, ultimately God wants us to watch the condition of our heart. Okay? He wants us to have a soft heart. In Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, the author goes through uh, this passage, and we're not going to read it all, but in Hebrews 3 7, 3 15, and 4 7, in these three verses, he says, So the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And for some reason, the Hebrew author says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And then a few verses down, he says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not Harden your heart. And then a few verses later, he says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And I think, wow, that's intense. He decided that he was going to quote that three times. And so he's really trying to get in there and to speak to them and warning about hardening the heart and unbelief. But more than that, he's quoting a passage. He's literally quoting a psalm. And so if we were to go to Psalms 95, 8, we would see that he didn't just uh, make up this, this uh, verse of not hardening his heart. He, he's drawing it from uh, an Old Testament passage in 95, 8. And it says in 95, 7b, it starts at the tail end at 7. He says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did the day at Massa in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me, though they had seen what I did. For 40 years, I was angry with that generation. I said, they are people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger that they would never enter my rest. And so all of a sudden, when we get to Psalms, we realize the context. Not that the Hebrew author wasn't trying to get us to address our own hearts, but he was addressing a crowd that understood the context. He was writing to the Hebrews, and the Hebrews absolutely knew the Old Testament. They knew where he was quoting from, and they understood that he was talking about when he was giving them an example. At the same time of telling them not to harden their hearts, their brain was automatically thinking of what the example was. And the example is, is that when God had brought the people out of slavery, out of Egypt, and brought them in across the, uh, the, the Red Sea, and he had done all these mighty miracles to change the situation in their life. He had done all these mighty miracles to take them from being lost and enslaved to the world and bring them into freedom. And he had showed them all these amazing miracles that they began to harden their heart against him. And, and, and so in a way, the Hebrew author is saying, don't forget all the miracles that God has done for you. Don't forget all the good things he's done for you. 
Re reflect on the way that God got you here. Reflect on what God has done for you. And before you start to make God your enemy, before you begin to start to question God, before you start to que question your circumstances, begin to reflect upon what God has already done for you. Well, guess what? This is one of those tertiary quotes. And that means I quoted somebody and they quoted somebody. So the Hebrew author quotes from the Psalms, and maybe this Psalm was written by Asaph or from David. I'm not sure, probably Asaph. But at any rate, the Hebrew author is quoting from Psalms, but he's actually quoting the actual story that happened in Exodus chapter 17. And so that's the passage at which we're going to go, and we will be in for the remainder of this time. So Exodus 17. I've kind of already said the setting. The people of Israel had been enslaved all of their lives, all their parents' lives, and all their grandparents' lives. It's all they knew anymore. And Moses comes on the scene, and God has decided through Moses to preach a message that they rally behind. They believe what Moses brings them. And God equips his man. He doesn't leave Moses out there to preach and to fall on his face. He allows Moses to operate and to do things that man can't normally do. He tells Moses to uh, pick up a stick and it turns into a snake. He tells Moses to stick his hand in his cloak for a moment, comes out leprous, and he says, stick it in again, and it's, it's back to normal again. He tells Moses to say things to the leader of that nation in, in Egypt, and they come to pass. Rivers turn to blood. He strikes the river with his staff, and the rivers of Egypt turn to blood. They're plagued with flies. There's boils on their cattle. And eventually, all these miracles end up with the death of Pharaoh's firstborn son. And God miraculously protects the people of Israel, the people of slavery. They live in a land of Goshen, and when all the plagues happen, they don't seem to happen in Goshen. They're protected. They're shown over and over again that this is a trustworthy message, that this man that they're looking to, this Moses guy, is going to lead them and he's going to guide them and bring them back to God. He is going to be the instrument by which they are going to be able to be freed from the slavery and brought into life again. And so they follow him. They up and follow this guy. A million people. They just get up and they go because Pharaoh is, is terrified. Pharaoh is angry. Pharaoh has been tried and tested and found wanting in the scales of justice. And eventually Pharaoh is compelled to say, get your people and go. And so they go. And God miraculously builds this powerful vision of, uh, for all to see of this, this, this tower of, of glory spinning like a tornado in front of them, a cloud by day to follow, and a pillar of fire by night. And Moses leads the people right to the banks of the Red Sea. And God tells them, you know, put your staff and, and, and stand there and, and the sea will part. And they cross and they get across and they look back and the Egyptians have regret in letting them go and they're pursuing them. And the people, I imagine, are a little bit afraid. They're a little scared. But in the process, the Egyptians that do make it in between the, the, the pathway of the water, the water crashes down on them and it, and it eliminates them. And a major majority of their enemy is destroyed. And God brings these slaves over to free land, free soil. And they are new. They've been born again. They've been set free. They're no longer living in the life that they used to live. And they've seen some miracles that you and I have never seen. They've tasted a move of God that we have not seen in this generation. They've tasted a, 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 the hand of God and the miraculous move of God in a way that, that left them without even the position of faith. Like, I saw it. <laughs> Faith is being sure of what's hoped hope for, uh, certain of things. You do, not see. Uh, you do not see, unseen. Faith is being certain of things you do not see. These people saw it. God brings them over and, and there's more miracle. He feeds them every day. He brings manna from heaven because they're in the desert place and, and they don't have enough food. And he feeds them every day with this miraculous food from the heavens. 
It comes down and rests on the soil. And he says, collect it up, but only enough for today and eat your daily bread for tomorrow. If you, if you take up too much, it'll spoil. And, and sure enough, they test God and they take up a little too much and, and, and they find that it rots and it stinks and it's nasty. But then he says, you know, on Friday, I want you to go ahead and take enough for Saturday because Saturday I want you to rest. And in their mind, they're probably thinking, well, it's going to rot, God. And so they take up a little extra manna on Friday, and sure enough, it doesn't rot on Friday night or Saturday. So the same bread that would rot on one day doesn't rot on another, because God is operating in a miraculous fashion to lead and guide these people into a new life. And he's demonstrating these miracles over and over again. And so they get into Exodus 17, and they've been free for almost two months. That's it. They've been free for almost two months, but it's been amazing two months, dude. It's like, wow, God has done great things. They've got more testimony in their two months than I can give you and unfold in my entire life. Their testimony is amazing. And the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They went from place to place as the Lord commanded. They were being directed. Their footsteps were being directed by God. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there. And they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Walk on ahead of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa, which in Hebrew means trial, and Meribah, which in Hebrew means quarrel, because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This hurt God. I, if it's possible... I want you to put yourself in God's shoes just for a moment this morning. Just imagine yourself. Mostly, I'd never ever ask you to do this. But for this moment, imagine being God and realizing that these people do not believe that you could provide water for them. Or, if it's not that you could provide water for them, these people believe you should have provided it already. So it's kind of like what Alex said. They don't trust in your timing or your direction. They don't trust in your methods, your timing, or your direction. And they have this whole repertoire, they have this resume of freedom to look back to. And so God is hurt. Their hearts are hard. They've been shown so much. They've been given so much. And their hearts are hard. They're in some ways like spoiled children. Because they have an expectation that, that demands everything in their timing, in their way. Was God going to leave them out there to die? No. Is it okay to be thirsty? Yes. Is it legitimate to say, I'm thirsty? Yes, Jesus said those very words in the last moments of his life. He said, I thirst. He didn't say, God, you've abandoned me, I thirst. And we could do a whole sermon on that. Because he does say, Lord, Lord, why have you forsaken me? And those of us who have been saved a little while understand, he was forsaken for you. So it's not that they were thirsty that is the sin. It's the accusation that God is not with them. 
because they have a trial. It's the accusation that because I am suffering, God must not be with me. Because I'm thirsty, God must not be providing water. Because I'm hurting, God must not be here as a doctor. Because I'm sick, it must be because God's not with me. Because I'm frustrated and my life doesn't seem to be exactly the way I want it, it must be because God is not with me. And God is like, man, I've been with you all the way through this. More than with anybody else on the planet has ever experienced me since the days of Adam. I am walking with you. I am directing your steps. I am parking you. You're not even camped here in this spot by your own will. I camped you here. So don't accuse God of, of not being with you because of your circumstances. What could have been a better way for them to realize that they were thirsty? What would be a better way? Like if we were to rewrite this and have them not harden their hearts and have them not sin, what would we have them do? They would pray. They would pray until the water came. Yeah. God, I'm thirsty, dude. Lord, I'm thirsty. I, you, Lord, I, I, uh, you have provided for us so bountifully. But I'm really thirsty. Um, Lord, you, you, you provided for us all the way here. I'm getting a little confused because I'm feeling parched and even my cattle are ready to feel parched. And I almost feel like we're going to thirst to death. <laughs> Lord, please see our situation. A place of humility and a place of gratitude, a place of respect, a place of trust, a place of acknowledging that he is your welfare and mind. But that's not where they were. And so it became a story in this Bible in which it's referenced over and over and over again. It was a sore part in the, in the, in the heart of God. Because who was supposed to be tested? Israel. The slaves. But who got tested instead? God. Ultimately God. So God had brought them out to test them. Why are you tested in life? In real life, why are you tested? Why are you tested at work? Why are you tested in school? Why? Is it to torture you? To, to, to assess where you're at so they can see if you need more training. Testing is for the purpose of growth. It's to take you and bring you to the position where you are or to say you're there. Awesome released go do what you're supposed to do you're ready go for it march it's a good thing but they turned right around and took their testing and tested god instead are you with us god or not god don't you see my situation where are you god where were you when i went through this and they turn it all the way around and so God tells his man, he says, Moses, give him water. Strike the rock, and from a rock I'll bring water. I'll bring them a miracle that's undeniable. Water will gush from a rock. And Paul later in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, it says, They all drank from the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Jesus Christ. Okay. And so basically, the Old Testament prophecy that's coming forth here is God's telling them prophetically, yeah, drink from a rock. You will drink water from a rock. But this is the rock that's going to provide the water of life for every generation. And it's through Jesus Christ. And we struck that rock with our staff. And we put him up on a tree. And when that rock was struck, it brought life to all that would drink from it. And so the story keeps going, and Jesus says, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. In Matthew 16, 1 through 4, the Bible says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And in the context, you're like, Wow, is it wrong to seek a miracle? It is wrong when you're ungrateful, it is wrong when you're faithless, and it's wrong when you're blind. And these people were begging a miracle from God without acknowledging what God had done for them. 
like confession without repentance, what good is it? They place their own expectations on God like spoiled kids without gratitude. It wasn't trust in God. It was manipulation of God. They thought by their words and their actions they could somehow manipulate God. In the end, God gave them water. But in the end, he let them die in the desert. I don't think he intended for them to die in the desert. Don't think that was his original plan. But because of their hardened heart, he let that generation die in the desert. And he raised up a new generation through their children. I don't want to be in that position. Last slide. I love this picture. Because, wow. <laughs> I imagine some little seedling tree was under that rock. I don't know, maybe the rock was split before the tree, now that I think of it. Who knows? But for me, the tree split the rock. <laughs> With time. And God has an amazing method of taking what is impossible to you and making it happen. We've got to keep our hearts soft, though. We'll keep them soft with forgiveness. We'll keep them heart soft with gratitude and prayer through giving, serving. By considering the ways of Christ, how did Jesus do it? How did Jesus treat people like this? What did Jesus do? Or in our circumstance, like when you come into a situation in which you're struggling and you're in trouble, you say, did Jesus have a situation like mine and how did he work through it? Because if you can keep your mind focusing on how Jesus did it, it will soften your heart. Because Jesus had the softest of all hearts. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that you would work to soften our hearts, that you would help us to hear your word and put it into practice. Help us to be receptive. Help us to decipher past the thorns and the stony soil and the path and the, the enemy of the devil who tries to eat the seed of the word like birds of the air and help us to have the soft heart that you desire. And through a soft heart, God, we can please you. And I know it's what you desire to do. You desire to love us, to take care of us, to provide for us, to lead us, to guide us, to nurture us, to give us life. Father, help us not to, to uh, fail under the test. And I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.